Subscribe if you like scary stories. When all of this began, I was just shy of my 23rd birthday. I want to make clear that I was a completely different person back then. Over time, I've become less hard-headed. When I was 22, I met a man on the internet. Let's just call him Guy. He was 40 when we first started chatting. I didn't realize at the time that someone his age could be as different as he was. I used to think he was pretty cool, and we quickly became close friends. That's how I felt at least. He was a good listener and would tell me all sorts of random tales. The way he expressed himself was always a bit odd. His way of talking was as if we were in a live-action game of Dungeons & Dragons. We messaged each other every day. Back then, I was dating someone, and this guy even became friends with my boyfriend. Then, for about a year, we stopped communicating. One day, out of the blue, he sent me a text. He said he'd lost all his contacts except for mine, for some reason. He sent me a picture of my contact details on his phone. It was a photo I had previously sent him, but I didn't think much of it then. Our friendship seemed to pick up right where it left off. He was going through a divorce at the time, and I was his shoulder to lean on, that's how he put it. He stated that there were certain boundaries he didn't want to cross, and so we started having regular phone chats. He began to hint that he wanted my help in spying on his soon-to-be ex-wife, since she wouldn't recognize me. He was overly eager to find out who she was living with. This was the first warning sign that I actually acknowledged as such. Someone warned me that he was a bit off and that I should avoid him. But what did I do? I kept talking to the guy, despite being told not to. Again, he mentioned the boundaries that he didn't want to cross. The second warning sign was related to religion, Scientology. He never tried to make me join, but he always wanted me to accompany him for moral support during audits and the like. I always turned him down. Once again, my friend warned me to stay clear of him, but I didn't pay heed. Soon, Guy wanted to meet in person. I tried to decline as diplomatically as I could, making up reasons like being busy. Eventually, however, I caved and sent him my location. I need to emphasize again that he claimed we were just friends, and there were boundaries he wouldn't cross. I agreed to this, but unlike him, I actually meant it. He turned up at my place on his scooter. I'm a fairly tall woman at 5 foot 7, and this man, now 42, was a whole foot shorter than me. The first thing he did was forcefully kiss me. When I managed to get free from this unwanted kiss, he studied my face and commented, I just wanted to make sure you were real, as if my presence in the driveway wasn't proof enough. I felt really uncomfortable, but since I was at my parents' house, I felt safe enough. He tried to convince me to ride on his scooter with him, but I repeatedly declined. Then, my little sister, who was 17 at the time, came outside. He immediately befriended her and convinced her to go for a ride. She agreed, so he took her around the neighborhood and brought her back. At this point, I decided it was time for him to leave. We still maintained contact, but he started to become very controlling, despite the fact that I was still dating someone else. Then he began asking for my younger sister's phone number, discussing what he'd like to do with both of us. I really wanted to cut contact with him, but by then I was too afraid since I had given him my address and he knew where my younger sister lived. Finally, after he had bombarded my phone with messages for days, with me responding perhaps every 20th text, I finally blocked him. Then he started texting my boyfriend, asking about my whereabouts. He was insisting on getting my little sister's number, even claiming that I had agreed to give it to him, which was an outright lie. With the messaging app I was using, if you blocked someone, you could still see the messages they sent, but they didn't trigger notifications and didn't show up in your regular text inbox. He sent me two lengthy messages, one in English and the other in Spanish, each spanning about 15 pages. He continued to spam my phone and that of my then boyfriend for months on end. Finally, he just vanished. I'm now 28, and fortunately I haven't heard from him since. I've definitely learned that red flags are there for a reason, and if your instincts tell you to keep your distance, you should listen. In early 2017, I was using a couple of popular dating apps, but I was mainly focusing on Tinder. After going through a string of average dates, 
I was almost ready to quit. But then I matched with someone who seemed promising. Her name was Lila. Her profile instantly grabbed my attention, and I really hoped we'd match when I swiped right on her. She seemed like a fun and interesting individual based on her profile. To my surprise, we matched. Our chat started off pretty smoothly, and it seemed like we had a lot in common. We were really connecting. We agreed to meet for our first date at a nearby park, where we could decide what to do next. On the day of our date, I sent her a message to make sure we were still on. She replied immediately, confirming that she would meet me there at 7.30 p.m. The meeting spot was the large gate at the park's entrance. I arrived there, looking around the crowd, hoping to see Lila. Just when I was about to text her, my phone buzzed. It was a message from Lila asking to meet at a different location, a few blocks away. It was an ordinary street corner. I wondered why she would want to meet there instead of coming to the park. But I agreed and started walking. It was only a few minutes away. As I moved towards the new spot, excitement was building up within me. I wasn't bothered by the change in plan, assuming she had found a better place to meet. But as soon as I arrived at the corner where we were supposed to meet, I received another text from Lila. She wanted to meet at yet another location, this time even farther. Even though it was a bit inconvenient, I wanted to meet her badly. So I agreed and headed to the new location. But when I reached the third location, a strange feeling came over me. It was essentially an alley sandwiched between two apartment buildings. There weren't any people around as far as I could see. That place had a dangerous vibe to it. My gut was telling me something was off, but curiosity got the better of me, and I kept exploring. At this point, I was doubtful if Lila was even real, but I couldn't let go of the hope that she was. I know, not a smart move. Out of nowhere, I noticed two guys walking toward me. They were dressed in dark clothes, jeans, and black hoodies. They were also sporting surgical masks and sunglasses. I attempted to flee the other way, but there was another big guy approaching from that direction, effectively trapping me in the alley. He was dressed similarly to the other two, just more imposing. I looked around for an escape route. The only way out seemed to be a door on one of the buildings, but it was locked. I desperately rattled the doorknob for a few moments before turning around. I was surrounded. The three guys stood motionless in front of me. Then one of them spoke. We're Lila. Hand over your wallet and phone. Tears welled up in my eyes and I felt so foolish. Despite knowing something was off, I walked right into their trap. I didn't try to negotiate. I simply handed over my wallet and phone. Before leaving, one of them threatened me, saying they would kill me if I reported them to the police. I believed him. After they left, I cautiously returned to the main street. It was already dark. I scanned the area, making sure those guys weren't nearby. The last thing I wanted was to encounter them again. When I was sure they were gone, I slowly walked home, constantly looking over my shoulder. Back at home, I considered contacting the police, but the threat made by one of those guys really terrified me. I was also filled with embarrassment. I wanted to forget the whole incident and move on. In hindsight, I realized I should have reported the incident to warn others. But I didn't. In fact, I never shared this incident with anyone until now. It's a relief to finally let it all out. When I was younger, I used to spend a lot of time on dating apps. Luckily, I don't need them now. I actually met my wife on OkCupid, but this story is about a not-so-great encounter I had on Tinder. This happened about five years ago. I was on the lookout for love, or at least something that felt real and significant. One lucky night, I was going through Tinder profiles and I matched with a girl. Her name was Lisa, and her profile was quite fascinating. She had actually taken the time to fill out her profile, which I really liked. The pictures on her profile were also good, but they weren't unrealistically perfect like some profiles I'd seen. It seemed like a lot of profiles were fake. I bet it's worse now, but it was still a problem back then. I initiated the conversation and we exchanged some messages. We seemed to get along well from the start. Lisa seemed smart, funny, and she liked a lot of the same things I did. We hit it off and decided to meet up. She suggested a local pub in our city. It was quite a ways away from my place, but I agreed anyway. The day came and I went to the pub, feeling a bit anxious. 
She was a blonde with green eyes. I looked around the room trying to spot her amongst the few people there. As I turned around, there she was at the door. She looked exactly like her profile pictures. I walked over to her with a smile. She smiled back, and we got a table and ordered some drinks. We chatted effortlessly, and it felt like we had a real connection. It felt like we'd known each other for a while. I was quite excited that the date was going so well. Time flew as we laughed, talked, and exchanged stories. After about an hour, Lisa suggested we head to her place to continue our date. I was surprised. I've never been one to go to someone's place on the first date, but I couldn't say no, so I agreed. We left the pub and started walking. She said her apartment was just a 10-minute walk away. When we got to her apartment, I noticed that the building was unusually quiet. It was an old building, probably from the 70s. The corridors smelled musty, and it seemed like more than half of the lights weren't working. The walls were stained, and the hallway carpet was worn out in the middle. There were several big holes in the carpet, too. The situation was a bit unnerving, but I couldn't fault Lisa for it. City rent can be a nightmare, and many buildings are not up to par. To be fair, my own apartment wasn't much better back then. With this thought, I followed her into the apartment, hoping it wasn't a big deal. As soon as we stepped inside, I could detect a faint smell that was hard to identify. It was different from the hallway's scent. I assumed she had pets. Perhaps she had a cat, and its litter box needed changing. The smell was a bit off-putting, but it wasn't terrible enough to make me leave. Lisa and I settled on her living room couch. We opened a bottle of wine and continued our conversation. Nothing significant occurred initially, but about 30 minutes in, the door opened. I figured it was a roommate or something. She hadn't mentioned if she lived alone. A few moments later, a tall man appeared before us. He looked mad. He was about my age but was a towering six foot four with a long brown beard and a backwards baseball cap. It didn't take much to figure out who he was. I immediately knew he was her boyfriend. I glanced at Lisa, and she was in tears. When I looked back at the guy, he was shouting at me to get out. I didn't hang around. I hurriedly put on my shoes and headed towards the door. I was out of there in less than 10 seconds. I practically sprinted down the corridor and out of the building, looking over my shoulder every now and then. Luckily, no one was following. I caught a bus home, still rattled from the adrenaline rush. I couldn't believe what had just transpired. It seemed like Lisa was trying to use me to either get back at her boyfriend or make him jealous. She must have planned for him to catch us. It was a really underhanded move, not just towards me but also towards him. There's no telling what he could have done to me. In a way, I was fortunate he let me go. I promptly unmatched Lisa and took a break from dating apps for a while. I really should have reported her for her actions, but I just wanted to put the whole thing behind me. I never saw or heard from her again. And luckily, all of my subsequent experiences with dating apps have been much more positive. The story I'm about to share is true. It totally changed how I think about dating and meeting people online. But let me first tell you a little about me. I'm a 22-year-old woman who drives trucks for a living. I'm a lesbian. I like my outfits a bit loose, and I keep my hair short and neat. Even though I'm still young, I've experienced a lot of wild situations. There have been times when I had to brandish a knife to defend myself, and I've broken up fights with full-grown men. I've seen some stuff. All this started when I was 18. That was when I began questioning my sexuality and wondering what it would be like to be with a guy. Until that point I'd only been with women, and I was single and curious, if you catch my drift. To explore these feelings, I turned to the internet and downloaded an app named Meet Me, hoping to find someone who I might be attracted to. The app was filled with weirdos and too many inappropriate photos, until I stumbled upon a guy. Let's call him Joe. Joe and I started chatting and he seemed cool, relaxed, and pretty adventurous. After a few days of getting to know each other, he suggested we meet up. I agreed, but looking back, I wish I'd never downloaded that app. We planned to hang out at his place eat some food, play video games, just relax. I know what you're probably thinking. It sounds dangerous and naive, like the plot of a thriller movie. But I was young and eager to experience new things, so I went all in. I went to his house at night. It was nice. We chatted for a while, had some pizza, 
and after a while things escalated, and we ended up sleeping together. Once everything settled down, we were just lying there enjoying the moment. When I heard a scream, I was startled and asked Joe, I thought you said we were alone, what's happening? He replied that his brother might have come home and turned on a movie. He went to check it out. I was left in his room, half-dressed, hastily gathering my stuff, prepared for any possible scenario. He came back. Joe was surprised and asked why I was packing. Weren't we having fun? I was confused and slightly scared. The scream had felt too genuine and too near to be from a TV. So I came up with an excuse. I told him I got a text from my dad and needed to head home. He was wondering where I was, and I had told him I was on my way back. Okay, let me walk you out, he said. He escorted me to the door and we said our goodnights. You're probably wondering why I didn't contact the police. Well, I didn't have to, until two days later. That's when I saw on the news that Joe and his brother had been keeping their stepfather captive, starved and tortured for two weeks. They had released him for a doctor's appointment, and he had immediately reported to the police. That was when they were arrested. I broke down crying. I realized I could have ended up like that old man, drugged and restrained. The outcome could have been a lot worse if I had stayed longer. So Joe, I hope you're rotting in jail, and I hope you stay there for a long, long time.